Good morning, everyone. I'm going to talk to you about a subject that uh, is very close to my heart and research interests, and that is the nature of education in a free society. But I'm going to do it from a perspective that analyzes the economics of higher education. Just under 250 years ago, a uh, philosopher by the name of Adam Smith wrote a very important book. We consider it important for all sorts of other reasons, but one of the lesser known uh, components of that book diagnosed the state of higher education in his day. And Smith had a very important observation. When you take markets out of education, bad things happen. He came to this observation by comparing his own institution in Scotland to a visitation he did at the University of Oxford, what was then considered one of the great universities of the world and still is today. When he got to Oxford, he noticed that the faculty were lazy. They uh, taught lectures that were decades out of date. The students did not attend class. The students were not interested in learning. And the administration of the university seemed more uh, interested in ensuring a continuous stream of salaries to itself and to its faculty than actually serving an educational mission. What was the difference that Smith noted? Students did not directly pay for their education at Oxford, but they did in Scotland. And when they did directly pay for their education, faculty responded through market mechanisms to improve their classes. In other words, students voted with their feet and dollars. They went to the popular professors, the professors that delivered. 250 years later, I would argue we are not only mired in these same problems in, in higher education, but they've also become entrenched with political and economic rent-seeking associated with the fact that most of higher education has adopted a stance that its funding model should come from the public through taxpayer appropriations. We are standing in the middle of, of one of the very few institutions in the world today that rejects that model, but there's an interesting market lesson there. What I want to do is diagnose some of the problems that have emerged in higher education and give you a glimpse of the data of what is happening right now and how we can look at some of these trends. Higher education is in an intellectual crisis at the moment. It's in the midst of an ideological hegemony of an anti-market, anti-capitalistic left. Its latest fashionable idea, critical theory, sometimes referred to critical race theory being a derivative of it, not only rejects market capitalism and liberal institutions, considers itself a validly opposed to market capitalism and liberal institutions, but it also rejects intellectual diversity. It rejects other perspectives, considers itself at war with those perspectives. Higher ed, by being a rent-seeking institution, has also directed vast amounts of resources into politicized degrees that do not deliver intellectual content, do not deliver knowledge, but rather seek to weaponize their subject matters to disrupt the world in a leftward direction. This is a direct principle that comes out of critical theory, the term itself, critical theory being derivative of Karl Marx's subtitle to Das Kapital, a critique of political economy. What is a critical theory? It is a theory that seeks not to describe, but to change, to alter, to, to disrupt for a specific ideological agenda. And that is growing on campus. But more important to that, the economic model of what's happening in higher education, and I can show you some data from the United States, although this is true of most areas where taxpayer dollars have invaded the higher ed space and become the dominant allocation mechanism of resources. Bloat is pervasive, and it's bloat of an administrative nature. It's functionaries of other offices that are not delivering educational content, but are delivering supposed services on campus, many of them of a political nature. This is the United States since the mid-1970s to today. And you can see the growth in the number of faculty and administrators. The faculty are at the very top in the orangish color. Administrators as executives are at the bottom in the blue. That is presidents and vice presidents. But the one area that's grown is this gray line. These are mid-level managerial administrators, bureaucrats, that have taken over higher education. They are consumers of resources. If you want to understand why tuition is going up, why money is being dumped into the higher education vat with not much of a return, there's your answer. 
And this trend has continued unabated even through COVID when most campuses around the world were shut down. The people on the gray line were still paid to do or not do their jobs from home. Faculty bloat in U.S. higher ed has been very disproportionate toward politicized disciplines. And I want to show you an example from two in particular. Economics, which actually works something of a market mechanism. The blue line here is the number of economics bachelor's degrees issued in a given year in the United States. Since about uh, the mid-1990s to the present day, you can see it's increasing. It's a popular discipline. People want to study economics because it has value in the real world. It's useful for getting a job. Number of faculty in economics has lagged behind. It has not grown as fast as the student demand for it. Why? There's an allocation question here. The other discipline I want to show you is English, arguably the most politicized department on campus, English literature, especially in the United States, and it's true of most literature programs around the world. You see the exact opposite trend. Students, again the blue line, are not really increasing. In fact, they've dipped a bit in recent years. Nobody wants to get an English degree because it's very hard to get employment with an English degree or a literature degree. But what has happened to the faculty ranks? They've grown and grown and grown. Massive amounts. Again, this being the most politicized discipline on campus. Even though higher education has adopted a funding model that repudiates market mechanisms, it cannot escape markets entirely. And this is the silver lining that we're seeing in the world. This is an opportunity as well to offer something different. This is a rank ordering of college degrees from the most popular, those that are growing in size. And you see at the very top things like science, the STEM fields, business, economics, entrepreneurship, basically creative disciplines. What's going on down at the bottom? Anthropology, political science, history, religion, literature, the humanities in particular, the most politicized disciplines. They are declining in popularity. Students are voting with their feet. What do these departments at the bottom do? They nonetheless try to require students to take their classes. That was their way around uh, the problem that Adam Smith diagnosed. On top of this, we've seen a rapid and pronounced ideological shift in higher education that's taken place only within the last 15 to 20 years. I use the United States again as an example because it has some of the best data in the world, but most other universities and institutions have followed similar suit. The United States has data on the ideological positions, political beliefs of faculty going back to the 1960s. And what do we know from that? From about 1965 to roughly 19... 95, 2000, thereabouts, there's a relatively stable distribution of intellectual diversity on campus. The political left was a plurality. They hovered at around 45% of all faculty, but the remainder was divided between what were classified as the political right, that's conservatives, libertarians normally are classified in these surveys in that area, and then political centrists or moderates. Those are the other two lines. So the blue line the political left, the orange and gray lines are conservatives, libertarians, centrists, moderates, everyone else. Something changed around the year 2000. The left started taking off in numbers. And it came at the expense of everyone else. The one that declined the most is the gray line. That is everyone to the right of center. That is where all free market traditions are. That is where all classical liberal traditions are classified. This is all, all right of center, conservative, libertarian, you name it. Declined so rapidly after about the year 2000 that it currently comprises only about 10% of all U.S. faculty that associate on the political right. The left hovers between 60 and 65% of all U.S. faculty. So we've seen a rapid politicization of the academy in only 15 to 20 years. Even scarier is this other chart. These are the percentage of college faculty that identify on the far left, the outright Marxists, the outright socialists. 
those that are espousing the destruction of a free society. For the better part of our survey data's existence from the 1960s to about the year 2000, they hovered at around 4 to 5 percent. Then they shot up. They're now around 12 to 13 percent of all university faculty in the United States. In other words, the Marxists outnumber all political traditions on the right combined. This is a crisis in higher ed that does not seem to be abating. In fact, the very opposite is occurring. A very opposite trend is, is occurring. They are growing. We're expecting the latest numbers to come out in the next year or so, and it will probably show a further increase in the leftward shift of the academy. It's also an unprecedented event for any point in, um, in recent history because even though the academy has tended to lean left of center as a whole, it was a stable medium. There was room for intellectual diversity. There was room for minority viewpoints to make arguments. That's being squeezed out at institutions across the world. But have faith in markets. Why should you have faith in markets? Because they actually do work. And uh, if we learn anything from central planning, uh, central planners cannot escape the very mechanisms that they're trying to manipulate, control, and organize from the top down. Market mechanisms are working in higher education in spite of itself. This chart took all of the different disciplines that I showed in that previous slide based on their popularity and put that on one axis. So down at the bottom, you have the number of majors, whether it's increasing or decreasing or staying stable over the past 10 years. And the important thing to focus on is this red dotted line in the middle. That's the break-even point. Anything to the left of it is losing majors. Anything to the right is growing. And what do you notice? Economics, business management, math, physics, health sciences, computer sciences, engineering are all increasing in majors. What's declining? English, anthropology, history, classics, religion, foreign languages, philosophy, political science, and art, the most politicized disciplines. And that's what the vertical category shows. The higher you are on the vertical category, that's the more politicized and leftward leaning that discipline is as a whole. Students are voting with their feet. They are rejecting critical theory. They are rejecting Marxism. They are rejecting leftist ideology that yields them majors that have very uh, little value in the real world, in the marketplace. And they're running to majors, to disciplines that have productive value in society. The students know what's going on in higher education as much as the universities wish to uh, pretend otherwise. Where does this leave us? Well, it leaves us in a, uh, a very interesting situation because one thing we know about rent extraction, rent seeking when it occurs, and when public institutions and vast amounts of public money are captured by a political interest, which I would argue higher ed has done, it's very, very hard to break that away from the institution. It's like getting rid of an ethanol subsidy, only thousands of times worse with higher education because there are so many interests involved. So I want to fast forward a little bit in history from Adam Smith's time to another economist, James Buchanan, a Nobel Prize winner, who wrote a great little book, and I'm going to mention the term uh, anarchy, but in a very different context of our previous speakers. He wrote a book called Academia and An Anarchy, and his diagnosis there was not of a uh, positive anarchy. Uh, he, he was referring to it as chaos. And one of the observations that Buchanan made in a postscript that he wrote to this book was that higher ed operates as a rent seeker. It operates as an institution of self-perpetuation above all. And it's an ideological institution but it's more so interested in taking taxpayer monies and appropriating it to careers in activism, careers in ideology. This is 60 years ago he's making this observation. Higher education acts as though the taxpayer has some sort of sacred obligation to throw increasing amounts of revenues over the university's ivied walls without so much as the right to inquire what happens behind those walls. Sound familiar? Inspecting a handout. And most of the higher education institutional mechanisms in the United States and most other countries around the world have taken on this model. And you see protests from faculty and administrators whenever there is pushback on the very sound public finance basis 
of taxpayers asking what their money is being used to fund. We had an episode last week, the University of Wisconsin, a public institution, major research university in the United States, paid what is probably tens of thousands of dollars to move a 70-ton racist boulder on campus that was deemed offensive because someone had used a racial slur uh, to refer to it back in 1925. These are the types of appropriations that run rampant in the higher education today. But what's the alternative? What's the model that Buchanan would ask us to consider? It's the same model Adam Smith proposed back in 1776 in The Wealth of Nations. And that is the model of market competition. Of not turning to a continuous stream of income from the government to operate, but to actually serve what students want. To serve what faculty are interested in providing and doing so in a rigorous, competitive, intellectual environment. UFM has adopted the Adam Smith model. And seeing the tour of campus yesterday, my first time down here, hopefully the, uh, not my last one that I want to repeat again. We saw a vibrant marketplace of ideas of education being offered. We saw classrooms, even classroom space, being allocated according to market mechanisms. We saw competition. We saw free and open discussion, a classroom style that's structured around conversation, not someone standing on a stage and lecturing doctrine at the students. These are all market mechanisms in play and market mechanisms around us. All it takes is one institution to break from the uh, traditional mold. All it takes is one institution to do something different uh, from the rest of higher education. UFM is doing that, and even though it's a very small institution, it's making an outsized impact in the world because it is showing that there is indeed another path. And that is what I see as our answer to the, uh, the quagmire of higher education that we found ourselves in. So thank you.